Search is critical to the way we all use and experience the internet. And if you believe Microsoft, that search experience is about to completely change. If you think about the web, we've had, what, three at least very distinct platform shifts that have shaped the web. The web was born on the PC and the server. And then it evolved with mobile and cloud. And now the question is, how is AI going to reshape the web? And this war over search is critical to Microsoft's future because Bing has just 3% of total search engine market share. That's a tiny amount compared to Google, who has the monopoly with over 90% market share. Alphabet, Google's parent company, makes $42 billion a quarter just from search advertising alone. So if Microsoft can capture just a few percentage points, it could mean billions in ad revenue. But how did we get here to this moment in time where Google has such a huge monopoly on search? And how could AI change the future of the search market? Back before Google and Bing and DuckDuckGo, there was a completely different breed of search engines. The modern search era as we know it now was started back on the 12th of December 1993 when Jump Station was born. Jonathan Fletcher, a student, was using a mixture of web crawling, indexing and search to create this new type of search experience and it was completely revolutionary. What Jump Station did was uh, the, the, the guy who created it created a crawler. That's Mark Sanderson from RMIT University. And Mark is an expert in what's called information retrieval, also known as search. And Mark has done a deep dive into the history of search and he's found some pretty interesting things. Because if you look back before Jump Station, what we were actually using to navigate the internet were lists of links that were manually curated. And if you can imagine this point in time in the 90s, the web was exploding with activity. Trying to manually curate all of the new information, that would have been a pretty difficult job. And Jump Station completely changed the way that we thought about search. So, so one of the things that these search engines had to struggle with early on was they had to find that content. Those early search engines actually just built hand curated lists or they asked people to, to nominate sites that you could add to that list and then you would search for things from that list. But what made Jump Station interesting was that they built a web, a web crawler. So the creator of Jump Station would start Jump Station at a particular website and that website had a bunch of links on it and the computer program, the crawler, was told, told to go and find all the other pages that, were, that all of the links were to. And then from all of those pages, they had links and it followed all of those links. And it tried to go and find the whole of the web. It brought information back about all of those pages and then it searched those pages. So for me, Jump Station was the thing that really characterizes web, web search, which is uh, a web search engine has this crawler that, that collects all of the content and then it has this content-based search that will search all of the content of those pages. And Jump Station was the first search engine to do that. Over the next few years, we saw an explosion in search engines. There were search engines popping up left, right and center. But why was search so critical to the evolution of the internet in the early 90s? There was a big problem with the web. The web was, was taking off um, and the number of sites that were being created was just growing daily. Um, hundreds, thousands of new websites were being created. And so people would come to the web and say, well, where do I start? There was the World Wide Web Worm, Webcrawler, Lycos, LookSmart, Excite, AltaVista, and of course, Yahoo. <laughs> There was an attempt by Yahoo to build almost like a library catalog, like a kind of a hierarchical directory where you could go to Yahoo and say, I don't know, I want to find some entertainment pages and you would go and find the entertainment category and then you would look down through different types of entertainment to find websites. What Yahoo was doing was they were manually curating that, that, those categories. 
and um, they had to hire people to do that manual curation. And the web was basically growing too fast to, to get people to actually keep on top of all of that content. And of course, the other thing that happens is the web wasn't just growing, it was changing. And so if you're building a catalog, you don't just have to cope with the growth, you also have to cope with the change. And Yahoo started to realize that they just couldn't, you just couldn't solve that with traditional library sort of approaches of, of cataloging things. So you needed another approach. And, and the only viable approach that anyone came up with was a search engine. My personal favorite of the search engines from back in the 90s was Ask Jeeves. Jeeves, what's a good fly to catch a rainbow trout on? A zug bug is a splendid choice, sir, but I prefer a Mr. Rubberleg. Introducing Jeeves, the world's first internet butler. Just type in your question, and he promptly finds the answer. Hey, Jeeves, what are the symptoms of hypothermia? Mental confusion, shivering, and a total loss of feeling in the legs, sir. Got a question? Ask Jeeves at ask.com. And what's interesting about Ask Jeeves is the focus on natural language processing. You would go to Ask Jeeves and ask a question rather than using a keyword search. And it was a really unique experience and one that I thoroughly enjoyed. And then in 1998, Google emerges. And Google started out as a sort of a, a research project just being run out of Stanford. Uh, but then in, in sort of September, I think of 98, so 25 years ago uh, coming up, uh, the Google company was formed. And really that's when you know, internet search really took off. So those early search engines struggled to uh, separate really high quality content from sort, of, from, from sort of less good content. And somehow the Google search engine um, did a very good job. One of the things it was particularly good at was finding home pages. So you came to Google and said, I want to find the, the, the home page of the ABC or the home page of the BBC and it would just find you that, that home page instantly. Uh, the other search engines struggled a little bit with that, with that approach. Um, and so yeah, after Google uh, appeared in 98, then things really took off and, and Google really be became quite the dominant search engine. But what made Google number one is really a story of indexing. Rather than just looking at keywords, Larry Page and Sergey Brin had figured out an algorithm that used a range of key indicators to rank websites that were relevant to a particular search inquiry. And these would include looking at things like the incoming page links and looking at the relevance and importance of the pages that were linking to a website. So that way you could tell, okay, this page is linked to from the BBC, so therefore it must have more authority than this page that's linked to from a personal blog. So they really cracked the code on figuring out the ranking of web pages and that made search results a lot more relevant and authentic. Well, one of the innovations that Google brought was this, was this link analysis. So they said, why don't we look at the pages that have BBC, probably BBC in the title, and lots of other web pages are linking to that page. And maybe we approximate, maybe we guess that if there are lots of links coming into a site, Maybe lots of links means that that site is more authoritative. Maybe it's a better quality site. And so that was certainly one of the key things that Google did. And you've probably heard of Google's whole indexing system by its name, PageRank. But Mark says that PageRank wasn't actually the key to why Google became so successful at search. And so one of the other tricks that Google used was something called anchor text. Um, and what, what's anchor text? Well, uh, a link on the web, that blue piece of text with the, with the little underlining that you click on, um, the text that's in the link, it turns out it's a really good summary of the page that the link is pointing to. So if you have a page like um, BBC, there'll be lots and lots of pages that have a link that say BBC in the link. And, and so what Google did was they didn't just, dis when you search on a page uh, on the web, they didn't just search on the text in that page, they would search in all of the anchor text links text as well. And all of those blue links would be, would be added to the text of the main page. And it turned out that that was a really useful clue uh, that helped you identify uh, high quality websites. And so that anchor text was actually the thing that really gave Google the edge. Um, the other thing they did was they, they, they kept their page, uh, their page looked very um, clean. 
and people liked using that. So the Google page was very fast to load. It, it didn't have any adverts on it uh, when it first started. And it was a very sort of lightweight page. And all the other web search engines were just burdened with lots of uh, adverts, lots of, um, uh, lots of images that just slowed the loading of those pages down. But, but Google was a, this very sort of fast, lightweight page. Following the dot-com crash, Google became the king of search, the number one player. And ever since, it's had a monopoly on the search market. And it hasn't looked at any point like any other player could take that crown away from Google. There's a really fascinating book on Google called Googled, The End of the World As We Know It. It's by Ken Oletta. And if you're interested in the search market, I encourage you to go and have a read of this book. There is so much detail on Google as a company and its evolution. And something that I think that was really interesting um, is this quote that was prompted by a question from a media executive at a conference. The media executive had asked, what value was Google producing for society other than shifting money from the pockets of traditional media to Google's? Ken Aletta had posed this question to Sergey Brin and he responded saying, it's very simple. People with the right information make better decisions for themselves and people presented with the right commercial opportunities will buy things suited to them. And this to me sums up everything about why Google is so successful at search. They've not only tried to focus on the accuracy of search results, but also decreasing the time that it takes to get from you typing in a search query to ending up at the web page that is most relevant to what you search for. And it's this relevance factor that Microsoft is focused on when it comes to improving the Bing search experience. We applied the AI model to our core search ranking engine, and we saw the largest jump in relevance in two decades. And we believe we can continue to drive breakthroughs as we improve the models. Now these graphs that Microsoft is showing are kind of pointless because there's no actual data on the graphs. They remind me a lot of the graphs that Apple posts every time it says that a new iPhone is X amount faster than the previous one. However, it's really interesting to see the way that Microsoft is thinking about the future of search. And if they can crack this code, making search results more relevant, then they have a really good shot at stealing search engine market share. I want you to think about search coming together with answers, search coming together with chat, and search coming together with the browser. As we all know, and as the folks at OpenAI taught us, the user experience is as important as the underlying technical platform. I've been testing out the new Bing and I have to say, I'm not that impressed by the chatbot experience. It does some things really well, like giving you a list of information that can be sourced from a range of websites. And Microsoft has tried to improve the trustworthiness of the results by adding things like citations. So it makes you believe that the results are the most accurate. But I also noticed some limitations. For example, when I was searching for a recipe based on ingredients in my fridge, Bing would actually present me with a recipe which sounded great. However, the recipe would also have ingredients that perhaps I didn't have in my fridge. And it wouldn't prompt me to ask me whether or not I had those ingredients. It would just present the recipe and assume that I did. And if I told it to change the recipe because I didn't have particular ingredients, the recipe would continue to get worse to the point where it wouldn't necessarily include much of the ingredients that I did have, which would mean it was difficult to actually make the dish that you were being presented with. The other issue that Microsoft has tried to clamp down on is hallucinations, because that's been a big issue that has been documented when it comes to ChatGPT and specifically with Bing. And what they've done now is try to limit the number of searches. You also can't ask questions of Bing that involve a conversation about the rules. There's Reddit threads where people were trying to exploit the rule book, and now you can't do that. Any mention of the rules and Bing will just shut down completely. Even if you try to tell it that it's operating outside the rule book, which many people have done in the early days, it will now just not respond and you won't be able to ask it a follow-up question. The results that are being presented are yes, relevant, but not that relevant. So I think there's a lot of work to do. However, it's clear that the way that we search for information is about to completely change. Google for the first time feels like it's behind. 
and Microsoft feels like it's leap years ahead of Google when it comes to the use of AI. Google stumbled with their BARD AI system when it was launched. It struggled to provide accurate information. And that's really the crux of the issue, is that if you can't provide accurate information, what chance do you have to improve upon the existing search experience? Because unless the search results are better, there's no point in using an AI to search for information. So I think these large language models will have a profound impact on search. The question is whether ChatGPT and Bing will, will be that, or, or the way that ChatGPT is being integrated into Bing, will that make a big difference to search? I think that's still an open question. One of the interesting things is to see both Microsoft and Google not immediately releasing these tools um, for us to play with. And, and I think what's going on there is Users actually have very, very high standards when it comes to accuracy. Um, if we're going to get a search engine to do something for us, we want it to be right, you know, like 99% of the time. And 95 isn't good enough. It needs to be 99 or 99.9% .9 of the time it needs to be right. And my guess is that these tools at the moment are struggling to quite reach those sorts of levels of accuracy. Um, Will large language models make a difference to search? Um, yes, I'm very confident that over time they're going to make a big difference. So while there's a lot of work to do on accuracy, Mark says that AI chatbots could have a huge advantage when it comes to contextualizing information coming from multiple sources. So, so most of the things that we see in current search engines, they identify a page and they pull a piece of information out of that one page. What, what ChatGPT seems to be offering is this multi-document summarization. So I come to it with a more complex question. Uh, what is the cause of a war in this particular part of the world? And maybe to answer that, I need a piece of information from here and from here and from here. And ChatGPT and these large language models seem to offer an opportunity to do that sort of multi-document summarization. Um, but they, the, the, these models are clearly still having some problems. They talk about this idea of hallucinations, so they still make things up. And, and the other sort of challenge with them is they don't yet provide um, excellent attribution about where it's getting these ideas from. I think that's what Microsoft and probably what Google are trying to do with their own large language model solutions. But that sort of attribution to sort of say, here's your answer and I'm getting that answer from these different sources and I got this piece of the answer from here and this piece of the answer from over here. That, that isn't quite there yet. So, so yeah, I mean, the summary for me is that they're, they're going to make a huge difference to search. I, I'm just not sure that they're quite ready yet to make that difference today. What's interesting to me about the current race to implement chatbots into the search experience is how similar this mission is to what Ask Jeeves was trying to achieve in the 90s. That is, creating a conversational search experience. So was Ask Jeeves just way ahead of its time? And how is ChatGPT improving on the legacy of search systems like Ask Jeeves? I mean, one of the things that I find fascinating about ChatGPT, uh, I, I mean, I, I haven't had a chance to try it on, on the Bing search engine, but the thing that I find amazing when I go to the OpenAI version is um, there's, there's, the interface is text, and that to me is, is astonishing. You know, computers have always been something that you have to press a button or move a slider. You know, it used to be physical buttons, it used to be keyboards, uh, where you had to know some particular kind of command. Um, it was always, there was always some sort of artificial way in which you interact with that thing. And now, you just write some text or you speak some text and this thing comes back at you. Um, and that, that presents a very, um, very new way of interacting with computers, something that we haven't really thought about before. Um, and you've got people using ChatGPT to, I don't know, uh, write some code or write me an email or convert this table from one format to another format. And you just 
ask it to do it, which is, which is sort of quite astonishing. I mean, Ask Jeeves had those intentions all those years ago, but it, it, it wasn't able to, to address the, the, the scale, the wide range of things that people might ask of a computer. ChatGPT seems to have a much broader range of things that it's capable of doing. So yes, I mean, it, I think there's always been a, uh, an interest in building systems that have that natural interface. It's just always been very challenging to do that in a way that sort of covers a very wide range of tasks. Uh, ChatGPT seems to be on its way to solving that sort of problem. What do you think? Have you tested out ChatGPT and the new Bing search experience? And do you think these could be the future of the way that we search for information? Just let me know in the comment section below. I'm really interested to get your take on this. And if you found this video valuable, just hit subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.